Pro Show is brought to you by Rockin' Media and our proprietary Flash HDR photo process, providing you with the best, most realistic photos of your property. Hi, I'm Rick Mackley from Rockin' Media. On this episode of The Pro Show, we'll get you caught up on what's going on in the Denver area and Colorado Springs markets. We'll talk about the pros and cons of condos and townhomes, and also how to stage the outside of your home for sale. We also have some great properties to show you. That's next on The Pro Show. And today we have six great Coldwell Banker agents from up and down Colorado's Front Range. We have Debbie Haining, kind of from the South Metro area, as well as Debbie Jacobs. And then on the West side, we have Laverne Brookie and Renee Cohen from the Global Luxury, kind of Cherry Creek area, and Lori Delaney up in North Metro. And finally, we have Camelia Corey, who is from Colorado Springs. And uh, welcome to the show, Camelia. She hasn't been on before, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Rick. Well, again, my name is Camelia Corey. I'm with the Coldwell Banker office down in the El Paso County, which, is, which encompasses um, Colorado Springs, Manitou, Monument, Fountain, that area. And uh, my team and I cover any anything and everything from first time home buyers all the way up to luxury and new construction. And by the way, all these ladies actually work everywhere. They just have kind of focuses where they tend to go, but I've done photos for them pretty much everywhere around the metro area, depending on where they have a new listing or if they have buyers who want to, if they're in Denver Metro, but they want to look in Boulder, I'm sure Debbie Haining and Debbie Jacobs are willing to take them up there. So um, feel free to reach out with them and we'll have some contact information for them at the end of the show. And this week we have the market stats for July. Um, the Denver Metro Association of Realtors has put out their total market overview, and this gives us a good idea of what is going on in the marketplace. And right now it's up, uh, the active listings are up 25% year over year. Under contracts are also up 4.2% which if you do the math, that would probably mean that we're probably going to have, that's why we have more active listings is because they're up, but new listings is also up 6.7%. Sold listings is down about 0.8%, and days on market is up 25%, but that takes us from only 26 days on market last year to 33, so it's not a huge jump. The median sales price in the metro area is up 1.9% to 590000 The average sales price is up 0.6% to 693000 And the percent of list price received is down from 99.7% to 98.9%. So it's not like people are taking huge price cuts on their listings. And I want to quickly jump over and... Camelia, what are you seeing down in Colorado Springs? Um, well, year over year, we're, we're in general seeing definitely significantly more listings on the market this year over last year. Um, prices relatively staying the same. Days on market have um, increased. We're in the 50-something days on market. Interesting note on that is, you know, townhome, condo, um, and uh, homes in that three to 400 price uh, range have a different days on market than the over a million, million, two million, three million. So you're you get above two million, it's like three hundred and something days on market. Um, kind of our sweet spot is in the four and five hundred uh, price range, and those are staying on the market anywhere from forty three to fifty seven days. That's kind of the range. That's uh, yeah. So it's it's just kind of a leveled. Uh, the market has leveled out. Are any of the uh, any of the rest of you seeing anything different here in the metro area? Area, we don't think the days on market is nearly as long. Um, personally, I think my condos and townhomes are in the like four to six hundred range, and they're they're anywhere from uh, say ten days to twenty four, depending on the area and the neighborhood. Uh, single family, it also depends on if it's going to be. Uh, 750 or over a million. Over a million can run 61 days. Um, but then I've seen some over a million in certain neighborhoods that back to golf courses or whatnot go off in four days. 
and still having multiple offer situations if they're like ranch style updated. So it really does vary, but overall, I think up north can correct me, but I think we're seeing a um, little bit shorter time frame of days on market overall. Debbie Haining, what are you seeing? Days on market has changed. Um, in the south end, it did increase quite a bit over the last month for us. But uh, in August, I've seen a big change, which is not common for that time of the year. Um, homes are going off the market much quicker. Um, but the median sales price, I think, is still remaining around the you know, $590,000 range. Mm -hmm. And Renee, what are you seeing uh, more in the downtown area around there? Um, so I've been in the 750 to a million, a million one price point most recently. And uh, things when they are priced right and they look good and they show well, they're selling quickly with multiple offers sometimes. Um, and houses that have had recent price reductions um, that have been sitting for a little bit of time, when they take those price reductions, then they re-energize their market and end up with a couple of uh, over, over the asking price offers at that point. But I think it's really price dependent. I think it's really um, how the properties show. And I think that the days on market are, are quick in those situations. And what about you, Laverne, over on the west side? Yeah, for sure. I'm definitely seeing now in August, it seems like June and July were super slow just because of seasonality, you know, end of school year, summertime. Um, now in August, it seems to have seen more buyer activity, seen more showings. Um, I am seeing properties that are really, really show really well and are priced Maybe with an energy price, maybe where you kind of think, wow, this seems like a good deal. Those properties are still getting multiple offers. So it's, again, it's condition fee and price. Buyers are out there, um, but they're looking, you know, they're not, they're not reckless buyers. They're definitely looking and taking their time and making offers. Cool. Debbie Jacobs, anything you're saying differently? Same, you know, same as everyone else. Um, I also think that the buyer does not really have much of an appetite for remodeling. So where there are dated bathrooms, dated uh, conditions of outside of the home, that type of thing, regardless of price point, I feel like that is what is really stopping a buyer from putting in offers. And of course, the power pricing of having that a little bit lower um, really is not making that much of an impact on a property that is not move in red. Anybody else have anything else you want to uh, bring up that you weren't able to? I was just going to say one more thing. Um, I think regardless of if you're a seller or buyer, I am just noticing a huge movement in the marketplace, which normally we don't see this time of year, but I feel like since it was delayed, we are. And Rick, your stats are from July. Correct. So there's a little bit of a lag time there. August, I mean, I'm talking to sellers and buyers that are both really wanting to find a home or put their home on the market this late in the game. So it's pretty encouraging to me. Yeah, it's it's definitely a different year. And and normally we see in election year that there are, you know, slowdowns this time of year normally because it's an election year. And we're not really seeing that. Or is that what you're all observing? Opposite. I mean, I think it's yeah. picking up and people are wanting to get either get to where they want to go before the election results possibly. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. I think it also might be interest rate driven. I mean, the Fed announced two impending rate cuts. Um, rates are in the you know mid sixes right now. It's a lot more attractive than it was a few months ago when things were in the sevens and approaching eight. I feel that the, buy, the sellers are actually more confident that they will be able to find a replacement property just because we do have this increase of properties that are coming on the market. So, in, you know, Last year, for sure, at the end of the year, sellers were very reluctant to even put their house on the market because they were wondering, where am I going to move to? And with the increase in, in interest rates last year, that really delayed that seller's decision to put their house on the market. Exactly. I, I agree very much with that, Debbie. I'm talking to several uh, buyers that have homes to sell that have been, you know, unsuccessfully navigating the market the past two years while it's been a little crazier to buy. And now it's like the velocity of the market has slowed down to where it's a little more palatable to find a home, certainly, 
and also to sell a home. So I think it's actually, you can you can buy relatively well and you can sell relatively well. It's less of a frenzy. So it's less stressful on them. So I think those buyers are coming out right now. I think we're seeing also the new home builders are uh, increasing their inventory, uh, which seems to be helping a lot. That that would definitely help. And cool. Speaking to, um, speaking to the um, average price where you know, last year, you, I think you said the stats were 99% of asking price, and this year you've had a very lower uh, amount of, you know, just a minor decrease at 98%. I think one of the things that that is a little skewed in the fact that oftentimes a agent, a selling agent or listing agent will propose a seller's concession so the asking price still remains the same on the MLS, but the concession that would be offered to the buyer would be a reduction for the buyer, but not necessarily reflect in that asking price percentage. How many of your listings right now are you folks seeing that you're having to do that, that your listings are have uh, the sellers are having to offer that? Camelia, are you seeing that down in the springs? Uh, yes, the homes that are on the market move in ready to go and you get multiple offers on, you're not seeing that. Um, but I would say 90% of all the other homes are coming, uh, con seller can And the other thing to, um, uh, piggyback on what Debbie just said is, you know, a uh, house goes on the market if it's priced a little too high, we do reductions and the stats are from that price reduction what the contract and close price is based on that new price. So what mm. we can't track is the original price down to the price reduction, then to the sell price. And that's, so um, I think the reality is sellers, we all had to make that adjustment. That, um, that's great that. information. Yeah, that's really important yeah. because we all think, oh, it only went down 2% from what they started asking. No, it's what they were, what they closed versus the last asking, is that correct? Correct. Wow. Okay. So it could be significantly more of a difference between original list and last list. And I think they're not settling. And so sellers need to hear that message. If you're going to be I, a seller. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they need to be listening to you so you because you're listening to the market. And if they listen to you and you're listening to the market, then hopefully they're going to get to a price that the buyers are going to want to buy, correct? Yep. I think the worst thing a seller could do is do part of what you tell them to do and not all of it. You might as well do nothing. And um, a lot of sellers, <laughs> well, I'll change the carpet, but I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. So I, I tell my clients, if you're not going to do all of it, don't do any of it because it doesn't matter. You're just throwing money away because the consumer is so picky. They know that they still have to do things when they move in. So um, at, at case in point, when you have a seller, they don't want to paint the inside of the garage. It's a mess. They don't want to paint inside of closets. It's a mess. They don't want to replace that brand new blue carpet, you know, um, <laughs> that, that they loved when they put it in. Um, but they but they want to do other things. It's like, oh, my goodness. No. So. Yep. No, but every client is different. Every house is different. But do it all or do none. So, in my opinion, so. And and I also think I think that's a great point, Camelia. But I also think that sellers get attached to a certain price in their head, and then they can't move away from that. I think that they need to let go of what they can actually get from their house and 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 do what the market is going to bring them. I think that that's a really hard thing for sellers to to navigate and understand because they're so focused on, well, I should be able to get X amount of dollars for my house because my neighbor down the street did. Well, you know, the market may be different at this point from when they sold and your house may look different and all the things. But I think that sellers sometimes spin around a certain price and it keeps them from a accomplishing their goals. It's uh... Well, and to that point too, a lot of sellers, you know, especially if they're the sellers are buyers, they're looking at a price that um they want to buy. So in that means they need to get so much money out of their house. When you're trying to price your house based on what you want to buy, that's not market value. And sellers need to understand that you know, those two are two different components. You know, their price property and their price, you know, they've got to understand what they're going to get out before they start really saying, oh, I want this property, so therefore I need to sell this. 
um, that gets into a horrible tailspin. Yeah. But yeah. it sounds, Lori. Along those lines, I, th I think many sellers are kind of stuck in last year or the year before's market. Um, but what I always tell my sellers and point out to them is, you know, market value is not a perfect science. A good indication if we hit the market value is traffic once we list it, which we don't know before we list it. So I always say, if you're going to err, err on the side of low, being under market value, because then you have an, a higher probability of getting a, a multiple offer situation versus so many are stuck in last year's market and want to price it high so that they have negotiating room and they end up shooting their, themselves in the foot and ultimately getting less than they would have if they priced it low to begin with. Chasing the market. Don't want to chase the market. And, exactly. you know, that, of, of course, if they only get one offer at that price, either you hit it really well or the, it's right. a really good deal, but that's what they pay you to do is to figure out what right. that price is. And uh, so I'd encourage that you listen to them um, if you're looking to put your house on the market and then let the market talk to you because it's gonna tell you whether you know things have changed. And as, we, as it was said earlier, we were talking about July stats and it could have already changed already and we're only two weeks into August. So, and it can go the both directions, I'm assuming as well. And today we're talking 2-1 buy down with Nancy Alexander from Guaranteed Rate Affinity, who is also not sponsoring this program. Hi, Nancy. Hey, Rick. How are you? I'm doing well. So tell me a little bit about a 2-1. How does it work? Well, a, a buy down, right? A te it's, it's temporary. That's right. number one. That's number two. That's number three. It is temporary. So a 2-1 means that you're buying the interest rate down two percentage points for the first year, one percentage point for the second year, third year you end up where you started. So let's say, for example, you start at six and a half, you lock your loan at six and a half. Your first year, you would actually be paying on a rate at four and a half, second year at five and a half, and third year, if you were still in the loan, right, you would be back to your six and a half. And what if your rates went up and you're four it's seven and a half are you still at the six and a half or are you now up at seven and a half? you are you're still at the this is a product it's a tool that you can apply to any loan product so 30-year fixed um, conventional fha va an arm product jumbo um, they're all accepting this tool as this temporary buy down to give you the consumer relief off of these interest rates that we've been experiencing. Ah, so it, it could go up if you chose to do a variable rate interest mortgage. And then at the end of that three years, you now, Absolutely. and it and rates went up for some reason, you could be at eight and a half because you're whatever well, the rate is. And that's interesting because remember a variable, you're looking at a five one arm, a seven one arm, sure. a 10 arm, right? So you still have to stay, you're in that fixed period, let's oh. say for the five one arm, right? Right. So this is this is just a tool to give you that relief for that first and second year that you're in that mortgage. Here's the strategy of the tool, okay. right? The strategy is that you would be using this tool for for a temporary amount of time it's a temporary buy down so let's say six months you're into this mortgage and the actual rate market rate has dropped from the six and a half you locked at and it's now at five question becomes would you refinance Hmm. More than likely you would because that first year you're sitting at four and a half, but you know it's temporary. Right? Right. So if you're given a permanent rate of 5%, why wouldn't you go ahead and refinance? But here's here's the, the kicker to the temporary buy down. You receive this bucket of money, right? right. And this bucket of money. Who pays and, that? Who pays? Who, seller. The seller pays so, for the bucket. They give you a bucket of money. Is, Exactly. That is a negotiation that you're doing with the seller. So let's say 500000 is our mortgage. Okay. Let's say your temporary buy down bucket is ten grand. Okay? Right. So we've got ten grand in this bucket. And let's say we're buying 1234 South Street. Okay. So as soon as we close on 1234 South Street, we have this $10,000 bucket and it's called an escrow bucket. 
What the lender is doing is they're pulling funds out of this bucket every single month for the differential between the rate you locked at, six and a half in our example, and the rate you're actually getting for that first year, which is four and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, let, let's use our example, Rick, and let's say that that interest rate drops to 5% for market rate. And you're saying, gee, I, I, I want to refinance. I want to, we know this is temporary. I want to get out of this. Right. You then you then initiate your refinance, but let's say you've got $7,000 left in this bucket. Sure. Right? It costs roughly 3,500 bucks to refinance. So we're gonna draw 3,500 out of the bucket to pay for our refinance. Okay. Okay, now we've got 3,500 bucks left. What can we do with that? Because we're closing out loan A. Sure. Right? The one that we use for our purchase and we use for this temporary buy down. So we still have 3,500. Now we're just going to apply that to our principal balance starting loan B off into the, the future we go. Ah, so you so, lowered your overall balance, which hopefully because you've now locked a rate and you have a lower balance, maybe your payments are a little bit lower too. Exactly. Or if you, when you use a temporary buy down, remember last time we were talking about discount points, right? You don't usually do both and because the whole reason you're negotiating the temporary buy down as a seller credit is that you're not using any discount points. There's no reason to. So maybe that money left over in your bucket, you're going to buy a point at the time of your refinance and get it from 5% back down to your four and a half as a permanent rate. Ah, so you can use it toward that too. So you can just use yeah. the bucket for anything except taking it out as cash. <laughs> exactly. So you're spot on. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it's it's a fun it's a fun tool and it's a good strategy. It is, especially as we're you know sitting high, at higher than average interest rates, especially over the last decade. So it's a great way to get into a house, and uh, obviously you want to be able to afford the house at six and a half percent. That's right. You know, you might be using that money to put in a lawn or something in your first year, but you want to be able to, by the year three, if interest rates don't drop, you want to still be able to afford that house, correct? You're, you are spot on because we qualify you right. at the rate you lock at. And in this example, you're right. It's the six and a half. Okay. So you've got to be able to qualify at that rate, not the not the lower rate you're getting in that temporary buy down. Yeah, no, that's super important. Well, that's great. Next week, why don't we talk about ratios and how that all works as far as getting you qualified? All right. Would love to. Thank you, sir. Have a great week. Thanks. You too. On this week's pros and cons, we're talking about the pros and cons of condos and townhomes, buying them, owning them, that sort of thing. And I always love to start out with the pros. So who wants to start this week on the pros of condos? I can start. Okay. Um, I'm seeing actually more people looking at multifamily uh, condos and townhomes because of the, um, they're getting to a point where they want to downsize and not worry about the maintenance. Uh, they're traveling. And uh, if it's if it's a well maintained property, they're selling very quickly. Um, you know the exterior and everything. I'm just seeing that to be a little more popular lately. How about location? Anybody find that that that's a key? Debbie Jacobs. So I, I think that a townhome or a condo often is a really great choice for a first time home buyer because they're not typically very interested in doing the maintenance for the yard, the exterior maintenance, that type of thing. So it gets them into a lower price point, usually, um, property. So that helps with that first time home buyer. And it also gets them a little bit more uh, comfortable with the interior maintenance uh, without having to go in full bore, you know, uh, interior maintenance and now, you know, a big yard. So I think that condo townhome is a good fit sometimes for that first time home buyer. Laverne? Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I mean, condo and townhomes take care of two demographics, both the empty nesters that want to lock and leave because they're traveling, they don't want the maintenance. And then for the first time buyers, because it's affordable. Um, and they, you know, it's like, it's that first step into home ownership. 
And it's like, you know, I'm no longer a renter and now I could, you know, own something. And, you know, let's face it. I mean, they're, you know, first, you know, buying something as a, you know, renter to buy something. It's they know what the mortgage payment's going to be. It's not going to change. And whereas with a renter, you know, the landlords can increase the rent. And so it's just something. And then they are going to get some appreciation when they sell that. So, they, you know, I think just um, the first step for, you know, any young um, young person, young couple getting into um, a home ownership. It's just a nice little taste to get into a kind of our townhouse. Lori Delaney. That's really seeing a, a large number of baby boomers to the condos townhomes, either as a second home to be near their grandchildren or downsizing from their big family home where they don't need it anymore because their kids are raised and grown. And they also are faring better in this market with interest rates because most of them will sell their family home and then pay cash for the townhome or, count, or condo. And so they're not, they're immune to the interest rates. So that's what I'm seeing the bulk of. And let's not to forget the investors, you know, the 1031 investors, you know, buying a condo or townhouse is really great for them because they can own something and they don't have to worry about like the, the yard maintenance that their, their tenant isn't taking care of. So um, I've actually had quite a few of 1031 exchanges buy into a condo and a townhouse. Renee? Um, I, you know, I, I agree with all the pros that have been mentioned here. I think if we're ready to flip the conversation to the cons, one of the big ones that I've seen recently is um, it's harder to get uh, condos approved um, for lenders and insurers. It's uh the ratios are really high in terms of deductibles and what the lenders will allow based on what the deductibles are for especially wind and hail because of all the storms that we've had in Colorado recently. So I've had a couple of uh, condos recently, not as many townhomes, but condos that have had trouble. We've had trouble pushing them through. We've gotten them done, but we've had to switch lenders midstream because of some of those ratios. Camille, you have a large military contingent down there. I assume a condo is a better option for that for a lot of them, correct? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, I totally agree with everybody. Just really nailed it on um, on the pros, and I'm going to hit on the cons. You know, insurance has been a really big deal um, with these townhome condos, and so the insurance for the associations have, you know, gone up in some cases 100 percent made uh, the uh, association dues go up significantly. And uh, I think I've seen several people in the townhome uh, community actually selling and getting out because the uh, associate in, in a matter of five years, the association dues have gone up from 500, or excuse me, from, from 210 up to uh, 450. And that's a, that's a lot of money for somebody who's fixed income um, or a young person who's, you know, still in, in school or, or whatever the situation is. So I'm kind of seeing that um, for some people, it's not really been a, a good situation. They've had to actually get out of them. Uh, from an investor perspective, I personally own townhome condos. So, you know, I've, I've kind of been seeing it from a personal perspective as an investor. It's still, um, a, a, it's still a great opportunity as an investor to bring renters in. But to that point, you, you can only have so many renters in an association. Um, you have to have a, a larger percentage of owners for these mortgage companies. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of seeing both sides of it, um, pros and the cons. It serves a lot of, um, you know, the younger and the older generations, but it's it's a little, a little tricky right now. You have to na navigate each unit individually and what they have to offer. So Yeah, but I think this is a conversation that we have with, um, with buyers, particularly that are buying into these, these these homeowners associations that their HOAs are going up. I mean, if it was just one community, that would be one thing, but we're seeing this metro wide. Mm -hmm. Every association is going to have a higher homeowners association. It's just gonna be a pill that they have to swallow. It's, you know, again, if it was just one community, that's one thing. So as we move forward, we're gonna be looking at, you know, here's your HOAs and yes, they are a little high, but let's put it this way, if you don't get that higher insurance, that good insurance that's going to cover everything that the lenders want, then you're going to have a unit that's not saleable. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, moving forward, if we were fast forward, you know, two years, uh, all the HOAs are going to be higher, but they're 
they're mandatory. You've got to pay them. Renee, um, it, it's, it, sorry, let me ask Renee a quick question. It's an, on, when you're looking at downtown, isn't that kind of one of, the, if you want to live in downtown Denver or Cherry Creek, pretty much for a lot of people, that may be the only option because of affordability, correct? Uh, I mean, potentially, but I think depending upon how high those HOA dues go, um, you know, you you bite into a buyer's affordability in terms of what they can what they can manage on a monthly basis. Um, I, I think you have to look at what you get for the HOA. What are the amenities that are included? What are uh, you know what are the do they include utilities? All those things factor into whether or not the HOA is worth it. But at the end of the day, if there's you know. It, if the HOA is not able to get their insurance because the rates are so high and they, now they're assessing their owners, I mean, that plays into, like like someone just said, whether or not they can sell down the road, um, that's a big deal. Camille, were you saying something, I think? Yes, I was just going to say, you know, as agents helping our buyers do their due diligence in yeah. um, what's going on with the HOA, the management, the reserve funds, I think that's probably your biggest uh, look, see, and due diligence is looking into the association in general. Have they kept up with the maintenance? How much is in the reserve and for what? And I <clears throat> I think if uh, buyers' eyes are wide open about the behind the scene things, then there's no surprises. But there are a lot of associations who have such little money in their reserve. Um, the reserve studies need to be done on a regular basis. And I think there's a bill getting passed um, that is going to require these associations to have X amount of dollars in their reserve for things like this, because it's falling on the homeowners um, in the associations through these special assessments to get caught up or to pay for the things um, that haven't been accounted for in that reserve study um, and in the finance um, year over year. And so I think that's my biggest advice to any buyer looking to buy in the townhome or condo community is do a deep dive and understand actually where they're at and what the risks are. Um, I know uh, when HOA boards come together, there's there's two mindsets. There's people that are like, yes, let's, you know, up our reserve. Let's, you know, account for, you know, asphalt and whatever, you know, things in the community. Let's be forward thinking, save money, because one day they're going to need to be replaced. The other side says, ah, we'll, we'll deal with it when it gets here. We're not going to raise our dues and we're not going to, you know, increase our reserve. You know, those are the associations that you see more of, and people have been penny pinching, and there are is not enough money to cover those things, and it really does show up very quickly today um, because you, for number one, it's the insurance, but number two, you know, all these older associations are thirty years later. You've got to do all that maintenance, and you have no money to do it. So, that's special assessments, <laughs> special assessments. I agree, Camille, and I think I'm seeing a lot more special assessments than ever before yeah. in the last decade just due to insurance and not tr and trying not to deplete the reserves for those kinds of capital expenditures like the asphalt and roof and so forth. So that is a con. I think what I try to do with my buyers is just really question them, you know, are you wanting to get into an attached dwelling? And, you know, what are you looking for? If they can't do stairs anymore, they want to lock and leave. And I mean, like the the pros outweigh the cons, but really qualifying them on, you know, is this going to work for them? Or are they going to get in a situation where they're going to have to move again because they can't afford the assessments or the double, um, the increase by 50% or more in monthly dues? And then that does make, like for the first time home buyer, the affordability of an attached dwelling a lot less. Um, just by the nature of the dupes. And Debbie Haining, so, and yeah, and Debbie Haining, uh, she talks about an attached. Well, attached means you've got a shared wall. I assume for some people that may be a negative. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, in that situation, maybe you want to consider an end unit just because it's brighter. Generally, um, you know, you're not going to have the wells on both sides. But I also wanted to uh, mention with the special assessments is look into your homeowner's insurance. Sometimes you can get a policy to cover a special assessment. Um, and that that could be, you know, a lifesaver in some of those situations. Yes, so I was also going to say that if you have an HOA, let's just say your HOA payment is $600 a month or $500 a month. I think it's really important to 
really have the buyer understand that that is a buying power. So you might be able to buy a, you know, $450,000 condo, but if you reduced and you added that $600 a month payment to a single family home, that could be like a 700 or more uh, different um, price point for a single family home. There is additional maintenance and additional uh, costs associated with single family home, but that buying power really changes dramatically with a $500 or $600 HOA payment. And I think also, you know, the, the, there are definitely pros to living in an HOA or a condo, a townhome or a condo community, but you also are at the mercy of the other residents in that, that community. You don't get to make all the decisions about the maintenance and when projects are taken care of and who the contractors are for the, for the monthly things that need to get done. So you really have to be okay with knowing that some of the decision-making power is out of your control mm -hmm. and it may end up, you know, you've got to be prepared for the risk that it could prevent you from being able to sell later on down the road if the ratios are too high for renters versus owners, or if there are a certain number of uh, owners that are delinquent in their HOA dues. All of those things play into whether or not someone can sell down the road. Laverne, it would seem like one of the pros would be in some communities, all the great amenities, though. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, if, especially, you know, you've got a workout room, a gym is like a big deal because you don't want it. You don't need to go and pay for um you know, a gym membership plus it's right there on your on the grounds. Some really nice um, HOAs have really nice clubhouses. You know, you can go in, you know, throw par private parties in there. Um, so they're definitely, you know, you got to look to see what is it you could t take use of. And then again, you know, then include, I think somebody said, what is your HOA include? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I'm going to get more into that, um, my amenities, then, then you kind of that's is something you can just justify in your that monthly payment. And it seems like if you're paying for something but not using it, then then you're overpaying. And now that yeah. and and when you move in, if it's three hundred dollar HOA and now it goes to six or seven hundred, you know, kind of keep in mind if it does double, you might want to be sure that you're uh, um, getting taking advantage of of what you're paying for, and you know, and then there are some com com communities like you know, that just have trash pickup and yard maintenance, and they don't have a lot of amenities. I've, I've run into those as well. Camelia, you wanted to say something? Yes, the balance of this conversation of um, HOA dues going up, increasing because of insurance and, and other things, keep in mind that in a single family living situation, your trash, you know, costs are gonna go up, your water costs up, your own insurance is gonna go up. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, not living in an association, it, you know, the, comparing the two, excuse me, comparing the two, both are going to go up. Everybody needs to know that cost is right. just going to go up. Yep. Um, so it's not like it's going to go up there, but not over here in a single family situation. So that's kind of the balance because I'm, I'm pro, you know, condo townhome for the right situation. It's just buyer beware more than ever before. I think it's buyer beware. And as we talked last week about HOAs and read those documents, I think is important. 100%. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Lori Delaney. Especially the meeting minutes. Especially the oh, meeting sorry. minutes. <laughs> the meeting minutes, yes. One important thing to find out in terms of coverage, what the HOA dues cover is roof. A lot of times the out the exterior structure is covered, but oftentimes the roof is not. And that is a huge benefit if it's covered because roofs in this day and age, I mean, they're really running a lot more than we realize. Mm -hmm. So that's just a good um, FYI. Mm -hmm. Good property management company, I guess, is something to also look into, if especially in a large complex, correct? Lots of head yeah. nodding, good. And joining me today is Greg Batchelor from Real Property Management. Hi, Greg. Hey, Rick, how are you? I'm doing great. You? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, we're talking about the city and county, I guess, of Denver's registration process for rental properties. And tell us a little bit about what's required. Yeah, that's a great question. So the city and county of Denver 
put guidelines in place. As a matter of fact, back in 2021, that basically said, hey, at the start of 2023, i.e. January 1, any property that is multifamily, i.e. two doors or more, uh, requires a process to be registered, to have an inspection done on the property, et cetera. And then one year later, January 1st of this year, 2024, then anybody that had a single family home, townhome, condo, any of that kind of stuff had to have the process registered. The only reason that we're chatting about it now, Rick, is that it is still catching a number of investors off guard. Uh, just a number of folks that did not know that that existed, didn't realize it existed, haven't registered their property yet. And then as soon as the city and county of Denver finds that out, then they're now beginning to assess fines and make you go through the process and that kind of stuff. So, so the more proactive that people can be, obviously both deadlines have passed, but the sooner you can get to it, the better your chances of not getting fined. They really have streamlined the process. If you go online um, to the city and county of Denver, there's a whole rental registration process, uh, getting an inspector on board to certify and or uh, tell you which changes need to be made to the property, et cetera. Uh, and then you can roll um, obviously from there. So anyhow, it's, it's a very, very important process. Uh, and the fines are only starting to add up for city and county of Denver investors who have missed one of those two deadlines. And are you, that isn't, you're not inspecting, it's actually the city or county, kind of like a building inspector, is that right? Yeah, and it's actually, they're independent inspectors. Um, there's a list uh, within the city and county of Denver, it's outside inspectors that can come and are certified and qualified to be able to do that. And then they will give you a list of, punch list of things uh, that might need to be done, taken care of, addressed, uh, et cetera. And this is not required, it's not just required at like renewal time of the lease. It was actually required no matter what, correct? Absolutely the case. Yeah, January 1 of 2023 was the multifamily deadline, i.e. two doors or more. And then January 1 of 2024 was the single family townhome condo uh, individual investment property uh, deadline uh, to be able to get those registered. But you can help them a little bit with the process as to who to talk to, is that right? Absolutely, more than glad to do so. We've helped lots of our investors do just that. Well, if you want to get a hold of Greg or one of his team and find out more about what it takes to get registered, feel free to give him a call at the number on the screen. And I appreciate your time again this week. Thanks, Greg. When it comes to staging, most people think of the inside, but starting out front is most important because you want to get that curb appeal. Who has some ideas as to what makes for good curb appeal on a property? I can start on this one. Okay. Um, I, I think painting the front door is like job number one. I, I don't, you know, the curb appeal, the first time you see a house, whether it's online or whether you're driving up to it, your opinion of that house is made before you even walk in the front door. And if you, you know, the, the landscaping, everything has to look really good, but the front door, if it's, if it pops and it's, it, it draws your eye in and it makes you want to go inside. So I think if you're going to do something for your curb appeal outside, painting the front door is job number one. <laughs> well, I think it was Camille who said either do everything or don't do anything at all. And that is the landing is definitely, you have only one time to make a first impression and that, that, you know, drive up to that house or condo, whatever the property is, man, if you don't, if it's not clean, you know, if you've got stains in your driveway, if you've got, you know, you're, you don't, I mean, flowers, I think always, always, always get a pot of flowers out in front. Um, so yeah, you only have one time to make a first impression and that front landscape is huge. Debbie Jacobs. And I, the door lock. The front door lock. <laughs> I don't know how many times you go to a property. It looks fantastic. You go there and the door lock has not been changed for 20 years and you can barely get the key in and it automatically gives that buyer a hesitation as to what other areas of the home are not have not been maintained properly. So that front door lock and the front door paint 
definitely a huge issue. Debbie Haining, talk about concrete issues. Um, well, you know, the driveway is sometimes the biggest part of the front yard. And if you pull up and you have the uh, stains in the driveway, cracks, you know, that's a huge expense. And that's something that the buyer is going to consider right, right as soon as they pull it. Like, okay, this is going to cost me a lot. No matter how nice the house is inside, they've already got that in their head that they're already going to have a huge expense. So I think that that's definitely something that should be considered. Who is yeah. pro, who's pro welcome mat, anti welcome mat? And if so, what kind? <laughs> pro? <laughs> pro? Pro welcome. <laughs> okay. Pro. Pro. Uh, yeah. Camelia. Like okay. One that says welcome home. Okay. Yeah. I, and, and you provide that. I don't usually provide it, but I do suggest it, or Mike Sager suggests it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Camelia, how about yard work? Having things trimmed, is that important? Sure. So I'm going to um, uh, do a little bit bigger picture conversation sure. here. I think yard maintenance, um, you know, I think mowing your yard and trimming it to me is a little bit like vacuuming and dusting, you know, on the inside. But the first impression, you know, we've said it here a few times, is um, you, you only get one chance to do that. But subconsciously, when, when you see an unkept yard, an untrimmed yard, stains on the driveway, you're going, well, these people didn't have pride of ownership, so they're not taking care of their yard or their driveway. They probably didn't take care of the house. Who wants to buy a house from somebody who just used it and, you know, moving on? They didn't care for it. And so I think subconsciously it sends a message um, that if you're caring for your lawn and trimming your bushes and, you um, you know, have clean driveway and a welcome mat. You're like, wow, pride of ownership. I, I, I like these people already, meaning I like this house already. And so I think it all is a subconscious message that you're sending to the consumer. And you can't, um, you can't forget about that because whether they say it out of their mouth or are thinking it, they're subconsciously feeling it. So. Anybody else? Pro things to do to get uh, your home ready in front. Yeah, I, you know, and to that, you know, you somebody was saying, you know, when they, drive up and they see maybe a cracked concrete, they're thinking, oh, that's going to cost me. Well, generally, in a buyer's mind, they're thinking maybe something that in, in reality might be a $250 expense. The buyer's thinking there's a thousand there. Mm -hmm. You know, you walk up and there's another thousand there when it's really not that expensive for the seller to go ahead and take care of these things so that they're not negotiating these inflated fees co coming from a buyer's perspective. And that, agree. that goes back to nobody wants a project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just gonna say back to the concrete. I think, um, well, I always tell my sellers, try to make anything go away that a buyer's eye would go to. So like if there's a, in fact, the other day I went, I went to this home, it wasn't to list it, but eventually, but there's a big giant crack, like two inches in the steps. If if that would, would be taken care of before the market, then a potential buyer is not going to think, oh, there might be structural problems, not just the cost of repair. 50% um, of buyers have the ability to rule out a property based on the curb appeal. And so I've literally had some buyers that they drive by before we're able to show them like maybe when it's coming soon and they'll take it off their list from just the curb appeal. So you want to qualify and be able to um, get in to show them the house. So I think that's another reason why curb appeal is so critical. What about paint, stain, all that good stuff on the sides? Important? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that a well-maintained home and pride of ownership is going to bode well. I mean, painting the outside of a home, yeah, the buyers don't want to get into that project. <laughs> yeah. This, and spider webs around the front, you know, the front door, um, gutters being packed full of leaves and branches, that type of thing, uh, trees that are clearly in, you know, uh, um, going over to the roof line, possibly damaging the roof. All of these aspects are things that buyers notice immediately. And uh, if you've got a front porch, do you stage that? Do you recommend that they have 
nice pillows? What what do you guys recommend as far as front porches? I, I think it depends upon the size of the front porch, but if you have furniture out there, you definitely want to put pillows for pops of color. I mean, things that draw the buyer's eye to the amenities that are on the front porch. It's nice to have a front porch. People want to sit out there. And if you can show that it's large enough for furniture to be able to enjoy some time out there, then definitely spruce it up with some color. Anything else? Yes, to, to, to Renee's point, uh, that's an excellent point. You really want to draw an, their eye, the buyer's eye, to any amenity, which is the perfect way to say that. Because if I've got a front porch, but I'm so busy trying to get into the front door, as an example, that the buyer is focused on that and not the the lifestyle that would be created by enjoying that front porch, that's what you really want them to focus on is what that lifestyle would be like living in that property. And what about, we live in Colorado, so we get snow days. Um, if you're going to be showing your home, what do you do relative to getting the house ready, you know, when it's snowy out? Definitely have it shoveled. Definitely. <laughs> if you're out, if you're not there, get a neighbor kid to come and do it or something, but 100%. Yep. Don't want people trudging through a foot of snow to get to your house. First of all, they're probably not going to take off their shoes. And if they do, now you got a water problem inside. So I want to make sure that uh, the the house is easy to get to and the front door is easy to get to. It's amazing how many times when I'm shooting photos, you can tell that homeowner uses their garage to get in their house because their lock is so stiff. And I'm going, talk about first impressions. So I think, was that Debbie Jacobs? I can't remember who said that, but that that's huge to have that that just change out the lock set. It's like $65, $70 to change out the whole lock set. And and then you've got that first impression of, oh, it works. And, uh, and, and if your house is settled a little bit, you know, make sure that it's still easy to turn that deadbolt. Seems like that would be important as well. I was gonna say, I was recommend too, Rick, that we, you know, if, if you shoot on a snowy day and the house hasn't sold and now the weather has changed, come out for a refresh on that shoot. It, there's nothing worse than having, you know, a spring day and you've got a foot of snow pictures on your listing out there. We do that a lot. And we do a lot now where we're taking pictures when it's not going to go on the market until November. So we come out and get it while it looks, looks great now. And then we'll come back out in November and take those photos. Our first listing today is represented by Debbie Jacobs, and this is in Greenwood Village. Tell us a little bit about this home, Debbie. Well, this is in an amazing neighborhood. Uh, this is called The Orchard, uh, which is just right off of Dayton and Bellevue. This property is 6,867 square feet. It has five bedrooms, and I would back up just a little bit because I really want you to see this sunroom. So this is one of my favorite rooms in the house. Uh, this is a custom home and it was built in 1983, but this sunroom is uh, south facing and also a west facing corner. And it is just so filled with light. You can see that this would be a great opportunity for possibly a piano room. And this sits right next to the home office. So if you wanted to entertain clients or have client meetings, that would be a great space for that. Um, that does also have an exclusive patio that faces uh, that particular room. And it has a covered patio with solid brick. Uh, this has got amazing space and little uh, entertaining vignettes throughout the entire home. I would love to have you come and check out the property. It again is uh, is pretty astounding for any type of entertaining that you might want to achieve. This home is priced currently at 2.3 million. And again, it's a little over 6,800 square feet. Wow, looks great. It's got wonderful um, custom features throughout. Looks like we got a coffered ceiling in the dining room or a tray ceiling in the dining room and just well appointed. This is a great home, looks awesome. Yes, and they've done a lot of uh, very interesting custom feature pieces. Uh, you can notice that the coloration of the floor, this is an oak floor, but it has a custom uh, color set on it. And it, it's just fantastic because it's warm enough in color, in coloration 
to be able to accommodate that that oak and mahogany walls that you see, um, and also the mahogany walls that are ceiling that is in that sunroom. But it's also a more contemporary color. So when you walk in, you get this really expansive space of this beautiful uh, floor that is throughout the entire main level. And if you'd like to see this home, reach out to Debbie. I'm sure she'd love to show it to you. Absolutely. Look forward to it. And our next home is presented by Camellia Corre down in the Monument area. Tell us about this home. All right, so this home is in the beautiful community called Kings Deer, and uh, that is just off of County Line and Roller Coaster. And what's great about this community is a golf course community, which is really amazing. The lots are about two and a half um, acres. So this one is, uh, I think, 2.51. Uh, the home, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful home with gorgeous views, expansive views. It's about 6,100 square feet, um, ample bedrooms and bathrooms for a family. Um, what's really great about this house, um, there, there are the views there. Um, you, you, you're in a neighborhood, but yet you have space all around you. But one of the things I really love about this home is that it has a, it's a two-story home with a master and an office on the main. So if you have children and later in life they they grow up and, and leave the home, you know, your all of your living is on the main level. So very large, um, well appointed. Uh, you're looking at the primary bedroom closet there. Um, beautiful woodworking throughout. A lot of custom features in this home uh, that were done. And uh, this is an upstairs loft. Every bedroom has a bathroom uh, associated with it. And one of the other really great features about this home is door level right now on that photo, you have a, a whole kitchen uh, wet bar area, and then you have a guest suite that's like a second master on that lower level. And we are seeing a lot of families that want parents to live with them or have disabled adult children that want they want them to live with them. So this house accommodates uh, for that. That whole lower level would be perfect um, if you had family um, that needed to move in with you for a, a full-time or, or even a part-time basis. Uh, very large uh, garage, but just a beautiful home. Lots of great sun comes in that home, and you can even see Pikes Peak. So it's yep. a beautiful home. So thanks for that. It's a pretty home, and uh, if you want to see it in person, feel free to reach out to Camelia. I'm sure she'd love to show it to you. Well, thanks, everyone, for being with me today, and I think we had a good discussion about a lot of great topics today and looking forward to next week. And, of course, if you want to get a hold of any of these agents, I'm sure they'd love to talk to you. You can reach out to them at the number on the screen. And remember, if you want to see any of our previous episodes, you can go to theproshow.com and check them out there. And there's a lot of great information on each of those shows as well. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>